Hello and welcome to the Pocasito webinar, Eco Innovation in Business Competitiveness. My name is Max Grunig. I'm the president of Ecologic Institute. The Ecologic Institute is a nonprofit center for environmental research and action in the United States in Washington, D.C. And we are running a project called Post Carbon Cities of Tomorrow, which deals with um, urban sustainability in uh, Europe and the United States and beyond. And we work on climate change, we work on um, energy, we work on water, and also on the business aspects. And with that, I'm here linking to the topic of today's uh, webinar to Jordi Oliver Solar, who's presenting today on eco-innovation and business competitiveness. Jordi is from Barcelona in Spain, or Catalonia, and uh, is uh, an environmental researcher. He has a PhD from the Autonomous University of Barcelona and has been working there with the um, ICAT, which, uh, or ICTA, the Institute for Environmental Science and Technology, and is the co-founder of the environmental consultancy Inedit. And uh, that's where he is uh, today uh, as the executive director, and he's working at Inedit on eco-innovation and business applications. So uh, for all of you, just an information, you're all on mute for now by default. If you do have questions during the webinar while uh, Jordi is presenting, you have three ways of communicating this. You can start a chat in the lower field of your control panel. You can type in a question there. You can also ask a question in the questions section or you can raise your hand. Either way, I will take note of this. I watch this very closely. And then after Jordi is through with his presentation, we will then get to you and your questions. And I'll also um, open your microphone, provided you do have a microphone, so you can actually ask the question yourself. So this will be interactive after the initial uh, presentation. So I'm done with that now, and don't hesitate to also ask if you have any technical questions during the webinar. I'll monitor these and try to help if there are any problems. But now I'll hand over to Jordi, and thank you again. Thank you so much for dialing in. For you, it's already early evening, um, so uh, you're, you're cutting away a little bit of your evening hours for us. For a lot of the American participants, it's of course around either lunchtime here at the, on the East Coast or it's early morning in California. So uh, welcome, Jordi, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. Uh, thank you for inviting me to, to share some of our work uh, here in Barcelona on, on the topic of uh, eco-design, eco-innovation, and especially some of the uh, findings we have uh, had from a project that is the Eco Innovation Lab that studies uh, how companies uh, do uh, make business out of uh, the environment or, the, or sustainability issues. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. I'm very, pretty excited to, to share this with this uh, American audience. And uh, well, we can we can start. I will show you some some slides. So I will hide myself for a while and uh, see you. Okay. Okay. Um, I will talk about uh, eco innovation. Eco innovation. Sorry. Okay. Eco innovation is a business strategy. It's a way to to innovate, so to to generate change and to manage the change, the innovation that uh, incorporates uh, environment uh, as a cornerstone. Uh, Eco-innovation is a, 
kind of policies that have been fostered by the EU and the different state members in Europe and uh, is now a strategy that more and more companies are starting to implement. It's not of course a mainstream yet, but it's the way to go. It's the way that uh, companies, small and large companies from different sectors are seeing that their competitiveness, uh, uh, the future competitiveness is split in, in, in here, in, in the eco-innovation. Um, one important thing about uh, eco-innovation is that uh, it takes into account all the life cycle of products and processes. This means that the company does not only focus uh, on its site or its, on its physical operations, but uh, upstream and downstream. So from the origin of the raw materials and all the processes that are um, that take place until this product and is managed uh, as a waste and so the company has the power to uh, modify to offer new solutions to take decisions in the in their design uh, to influence upstream and downstream processes uh, reducing the environmental impact of their operations and having a better market positioning. What we, I will try to, to share with you is the, the idea uh, to make clear that eco-innovation is, is a matter of uh, being competitive. No? To, to eco-innovate is a matter of being more competitive as a, as a company. Um, I have a long, a long uh, presentation with many slides, but I will skip some of them and I will go directly to, to the point to allow some time for discussion. How does it materialize? How, how, how do we eco-innovate? How do we help companies or, or support companies to, to eco-innovate? So we do it at different uh, levels, at product level, at the organization or, or more at the strategy level. At the product level, uh, we do talk about eco-design. Eco-design, there is an eco-design directive in the European Union, so by, by law, uh, some products, especially uh, those energy-related products, uh, do have to comply some eco-design specifications, but uh, there is also an ISO standard, 14.6, 14,006, sorry, uh, that uh, deals on eco-design. Eco the idea of, uh, of eco-design um, is that in the design phase, when the designers, the engineers or architects are thinking on their products, are just conceptualizing the, the product, the process, the building or even the neighborhood they will build, they will build. Uh, they can estimate uh, around 80% of the impacts because they are deciding on the materials that will be involved, on the production processes. They are deciding on how, how the the use phase will be. They are deciding whether the product will be easy to repair, to maintain, if it will be recyclable or not. So there, there are many, many design decisions that can influence the impact of the product. So this, this phase is crucial. We do also use tools for monitoring. Monitor, we monitor uh, the impacts of products and processes, uh, the amount of the, the, the carbon footprint, the water footprint, etc. Uh, measuring to take decisions and taking decisions to improve. No? And also we will see some examples of new business models, new eco-innovative business models uh, that provide um, economic benefits and at the same time, environmental and social benefits. I will show you um, some motivations. Why do companies uh, eco-innovate? Which, which are the drivers? Which are the barriers that they encounter? And which are the benefits that, that they achieve? And I will go directly to, to the motivations to show you some, some examples. 
the motivations for equinations, there, there are many. We have studied um, around 100 cases of companies that have equinovated from all over the world. And we have seen that the main motivation for uh, eco-innovation, so to innovate and to produce better, uh, environmentally better products, uh, is the market, the demand. You know? uh, to meet customer requirements to, or to anticipate to, to future uh, requirements both from the market, from the customers, or from uh, legal requirements. Um, an example uh, of this uh, is, for example, the company Gerbao. This is a Catalan company, uh, 700 workers, and uh, is competing worldwide. So it's a world uh, leader on uh, industrial dryers, you know, and washing machines and, and dryers for uh, laundry facilities, you know, for industrial laundries. Um, they are competing, for instance, for, with German technology, and they are doing so, and they can compete globally because they have been doing uh, research and innovation on energy efficiency. Their customers, the, the industrial laundries, have very high energy bills. As you can imagine uh, a warehouse full of uh, washing machines and dryers consuming lots of energy 24 hours, uh, four days a week, uh, seven days a week. And, um, and so the energy bill is an issue for the customers. What they do is to de they have developed a uh, dryer that is 15% more efficient than their competitors. So the investment on their product pays for, its, for itself. The, their, their, they help their customers to save energy, to save cost, to save emissions. Another example of, of motivation, of driver for eco-innovation is a matter of uh, having a good reputation, a good positioning uh, to differentiate them, the company in the market. No? I will show you one case of a Swedish um, company that is a restaurant, the fast food uh, restaurant, that is Max Burgers. Max Burgers is based in Sweden, they only have restaurants in, in Sweden, they have 3,000 uh, restaurants, so it's uh, an important chain but only based in Sweden. They are competing of course with other brands, uh, very well known in, in this sector, no? that have uh, worldwide uh, um, implantation. In uh, back, back in was in 2008, they uh, estimated, they made an assessment of the carbon footprint of their operations. So they wanted to know the impact of their company, of their operations to the climate change. And they uh, learned that most of their uh, carbon emissions had their origin on the beef, so on, on the on the cows, no? uh, on the cattle, and, and therefore they had a problem for reducing this. So they were selling uh, beef burgers and the problem was on, on the beef. What they did uh, was to introduce in their menus different uh, ingredients. So they started to sell chicken burgers, fish burgers, soy burgers, in addition to their beef burgers, and they uh, communicated to their uh, customers the carbon footprint of the different products. So the, the customers, besides the, the price and other informations, also knew the carbon footprint of each product. What they have achieved is that the sellings of those low carbon menus have increased by 28% since 2008. The brand loyalty has also increased 27% uh, between 2007 and 2009. Half of, the, of that is due to the environmental strategy, which means an added revenues of uh, 8 million euros per year. And what is more interesting is that the 
profit margin of these uh, burgers, of these chicken burgers, is from three to five times larger than the beef burgers because the raw material is, is cheaper. So they are competing with uh, very large brands by being uh, more transparent on their, their carbon emissions. A third motivation is the efficiency, gaining efficiency. Um, when we talk about uh, eco-design, we, uh, are, we are combining strategies that are good for the environment but also good for the economy. That means that uh, optimizing uh, packaging, for instance, uh, means using less materials, optimizing the logistics, reducing the amount of waste. So this is, uh, this is less cost for the company and also lower impact. One example of, of, of eco-design is uh, the Spanish retail uh, company Mercadona, um, which is one of the largest companies in, in the country. And what they have done is that between 2009 and 2012, they have uh, they, they started to eco-design their packaging. And one example of this was the the redesign of the olive oil uh, bottles. The original bottles were cylindrical, one one liter uh, of one liter bottle of, of what it was cylindrical. Cylindrical bottles uh, are, do not optimize the transportation because in, in the boxes there are empty empty spaces. Uh, what they did was a very basic and low cost strategy that was changing the shape of the bottles and making them uh, with uh, squared so that they can fill perfectly well the, the boxes the boxes fill the tracks, etc. So they do not transport air. With very cheap and smart uh, design decisions, they could reduce one third of the wastes of packaging per kilogram of product served. This means that they reduce 30% the amount of materials consumed for the packaging. This is not, in, not only the one benefit in, using, in generating less waste, but also uh, they had to transport less materials, of course, because the, the packaging was not there. They could reduce six million kilometers per road. This means at the end, it's like um, 150 um, trips around the earth uh, saving 24 million euros in, in, in transportation. So again, uh, gaining efficiency, optimizing solutions that are good for the environment but also good for, uh, for the company. And finally, the last uh, motivation is to anticipate to new regulations. Um, there are different examples of, of companies that they have seen that uh, there was a, a menace or there was a, uh, a law uh, in the parliament that was being discussed so they, they anticipated to this uh, instead of waiting to the last minute to, to adapt it to, to, to the to new regulations and of course we don't we not consider that uh, the that fulfilling the, requir the legal requirements is to innovate, but it's true that while seeking ways of fulfilling the legal requirements, some companies do uh, innovate and encounter new solutions. Uh, one example, this is not the one you're, you're seeing here, uh, but that is maybe one more example is more clear, uh, was the painting industry. In Europe, back to the late 90s, 1990s, there, was, uh, there were new regulations that banned the use of uh, certain substances uh, that had uh, volatile or organic compounds. Um, 
So all the painting industry had to reformulate their paintings. But some of these companies just um, removed the volatile organic compounds, and that was fine. Some others uh, did found new recipes based on water that fulfilled the ecological product requirements, and now they are certified, and they are serving uh, more demanding markets such as the, the sustainable uh, architecture sector, etc. But uh, um, of course, the the road, the way is not easy. Uh, uh, not everything is uh, a love story. There are difficulties and um, and barriers for implementing eco innovation. I have shown you some successful stories, but for being success, successful, companies do have to overcome barriers. After analyzing more than 100 cases, we have uh, classified these barriers. The most important, or some of them the most relevant, uh, are the internal, internal barriers. So um, changes that have to be done in the company itself, uh, cultural changes, changes in the business model, changes in the, the processes, uh, etc. Um, sometimes we are ourselves the first barrier for uh, implementing changes in our organizations because uh, something has always done in a certain way so that we want to keep doing this, the things as, 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 as always. No? Another barrier are financial. Sometimes some eco-innovations do require investments and I don't know what's, what's the case in the, in the US but in Europe and more specifically in Spain after uh, the, the financial crisis, um, companies are not uh, willing to to take risks, and so uh, the the payback periods have to be very short. This is a difficult, another difficulty for for eco innovation and for innovation in general. Another uh, barrier uh, are uh, the markets or the customers. Um, the acceptance of, of these new products, these new business models is an issue. We've been talking for instance, with very large companies, with very large European companies or the chemical sector uh, like BASF, uh, you know, very large German company on, on the chemical sector or Dow, Dow Chemical, uh, which are developing new business models, which are introducing uh, sustainability uh, in their products or taking into account sustainability in the development of their products and their, their portfolios. But when talking to them, they say, my customers do ask me to have environmentally better products but if I add more cost, so if I charge the cost of the research and the development of, of these innovations, I'm out of the market. So we are finding customers that do ask for some improvements, but are not willing to pay for them. And the, the costs of the product are the first, uh, the first thing that the customers take into account. So there's, a, a, there's also a gap uh, between what people say is that they want. So when, when there are surveys, for instance, Eurost, Eurostat, so the statistics office for the European Union uh, makes a survey and they ask to the European citizens uh, whether they were willing to pay more for environmentally better products. So the answer is 70% yes. They, they ask whether uh, they by uh, certified e ecological products and people say yes but the reality is that uh, it's not like this so there's a gap between what people say or knows they should do and what they really do and this is also a barrier for companies of course there's a barrier also with uh, there are barriers with the suppliers 
there are experiences of uh, companies that willing to, for instance, to incorporate uh, recycled materials uh, instead of raw materials uh, of virgin origin, or no, uh, but uh, it's not easy to find the supplier. Once you find the supplier, maybe the, the amount they can supply is not enough, or the quality, or the price, etc., etc., etc. So sometimes the, the theory is nice, but w once uh, it's into practice, it's not so easy. And also there are the context barriers. No? Uh, for instance, the electric electric car. The electric car is a well-known technology. Uh, it's fully developed, is in the market, but requires uh, uh, stations for char charging the, the batteries. Uh, in a country without this infrastructure, uh, this technology cannot be successful. But implementing this uh, infrastructure is uh, something that the companies alone uh, may not be able to do. So there's a need for collaboration for uh, public and private uh, uh, agreements for developing uh, a satisfactory network of electric uh, chargers, uh, charging facilities. No? So there are many, many barriers, but um, I will show you some, some examples of, of real cases. Uh, for instance, this is the, the case of Cosentino. This is a, a Spanish company um, that is well known for the, the, the brand that is Silestone. That is, uh, they, they produce um, cooking uh, surfaces, hard surfaces uh, for, the, for the kitchens uh, that substitute the, the marble or the granite um, made out of uh, dust from from granite from from not natural stone dust uh, they realized that they, there was a market within lead certified buildings that uh, had extra points if they could in, incorporate uh, recycled materials so they did uh, research on developing this kind of surfaces uh, cooking surfaces for for the kitchens uh, made of recycled materials. They tried with uh, seashells, but uh, technically it was not uh, correct or it didn't work because uh, the acids uh, eroded the, the surfaces. Then they tried with uh, glass and glass waste, mirror waste, etc. And they could develop a solution. But they could develop the prototype, a few prototypes but they wanted to go to the US market and they needed a large production for this market and for the lead certified buildings uh, that they, they were heading um, and the project was close to fail because uh, they couldn't find enough suppliers of uh, glass waste etc. No? So sometimes you have the good idea, the market is there the product is excellent, the prototype works, but uh, the suppliers are not ready because uh, we are still in a lineal economy. We are used to have a very good uh, virgin uh, raw material suppliers, but not recycled. It's, it's more difficult. There are internal variables, as I said, and I will show you a last case because uh, we, I want to leave some, some time for, for discussion. Um, of Rico, uh, this is a printers and photocopier manufacturer. They have developed a new business model uh, that is based on remanufacturing. 20% uh, of their sellings in Europe are already of remanufactured products. This means that when they have a leasing contract with a large con company or uh, organization uh, and they lease uh, hundreds of photocopiers, for instance, to, to a large company. Uh, after the period uh, of use, they recover those photocopiers and they know 
that most of the components are still perfectly uh, valid, they can be reused. So they take these uh, machines, they bring them to the facilities, dismantle them, recover the components and build new uh, photocopiers with 100% warranty uh, and resell them. This means that they of course reduce the amount of uh, raw materials that they consume drastically, uh, but also uh, they increase the profit margin because they do not need to buy new raw materials. The problem here, the issue, was that all the organization was prepared for receiving the components and the materials from their suppliers and building from this uh, the product, but they were not used to recover um, out of use or used uh, photocopiers, to dismantling them, etc. Uh, and this was the, the barrier, this was the difficulty. Once they have overcome this, uh, the design of the products uh, will change. Because once you know that you have a product that is not, doesn't have one single use, but that we, you, will, you know where this product is installed, where is it used? You know that we, you will have time to you will have to 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 recover it. So it's it's yours basically, and it's the raw materials. So now the raw materials are not more in the in the mine. The raw materials are in the economy. Some some figures, for instance, say that two thirds of wool copper reserved reserves have already been. Uh, exploded, so they are not in the mines anymore, two-thirds of copper reserves, and they are being recycled worldwide uh, on a rate of 30 percent. So this is pretty scary, and so uh, large companies are starting to see that in the mid-term uh, there will be uh, material uh, scarcity or the, 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 the prices of raw materials will increase. So why to use them only once? if there can be business models that they can use and to keep the materials and, and, and take advantage and use this stock of materials one time after another and another and another, which gives them more uh, freedom and makes them more uh, resistant to uh, future uh, menaces. Well, um, uh, we go directly to the to the benefits to to finish. Uh, the benefits are clear. Those companies that, that overcome the the barriers have clear benefits. We have identified several uh, so, some of them. No? Uh, business benefits uh, in terms of innovation. Companies that have uh, started this kind of processes um, to have new products that are more functional, new business models that are more resilient uh, in, in the, in the mid-term. Uh, they can increase market uh, share and the sales. So the, the thinking on an European economy and uh, European uh, companies, uh, our internal market in terms of national, uh, of, of state markets are pretty small compared to the US. Uh, and even though uh, we have a unified market, uh, European market, uh, there are many differences between countries, uh, cultural and, and many, many differences. Uh, therefore, uh, Spanish companies or Catalan companies are faced to exportation. Um, exportation to some markets that are uh, more, um, have higher environmental standards. So in order to be competitive, it's uh, imperative to have a strong sustainability record. Also, in terms of reputation, companies that uh, for instance, uh, Volkswagen, no, yeah, it's no, no, no need to comment more, but all the dis dieselgate sc scandal. Um, if, if you think on, on Volkswagen, 
probably before the scandal, uh, having or uh, saying that they had a good or very low uh, emissions, uh, maybe was not uh, an incentive for buying their products, or not so that no more people uh, bought their product because of this. But once uh, uh, the scandal uh, was revealed, uh, then yes, the sales decreased. So companies deal uh, with environment not only because of reducing the impact but also for preventing scandals of this risk, uh, managing the, the risks not only in their facilities but also in all the, all the chain, the value chain and reducing costs. And all these, all these eco-innovations have a return, have a, a better functional products, more emotional, keeping jobs at home, uh, the eco-innovation and the circular economy like the like the remanufacturing I, I have explained for, for RICO uh, means that instead of importing uh, materials or manufactured goods from uh, low-cost uh, countries uh, and using them in Europe and dealing with the wastes in Europe, what we are doing is to have a stock of products in Europe that are recovered, reused, remanufactured in Europe, so that the labor, uh, the workers, are also based in, in, in the European economies instead of outsourcing or externalizing this. And all this has a consequence in environment, on environmental uh, benefits and savings. No? So there's a uh, tri triple uh, win for the company, for the, for the users, the society, and the environment. Um, we're, that's, we're getting that's all. towards the time limit. I'm, I didn't want to stop you. I'm just saying, uh, if you if you need a few more minutes, please go ahead. No, it's it's fine. I think we can we can start the the discussion. Uh, yeah. Of course, we could be talking a lot of time, but I think it's enough for giving a first uh, uh, impression of what what we what we do. Absolutely, absolutely. No, it's really great. Thank you, Jordi. Uh, thank you very much for sharing this information about uh, ideas about business resilience. I thought that was extremely impressive. Uh, also, maybe you can um, also expand later a little bit more about the general concept of that circular economy. I want to add a little disclaimer here right away. Uh, I am not uh, connected at all to Max Burgers in uh, Sweden, <laughs> so, so this was uh, just purely coincidental. But I do have to add, we had a spontaneous comment, uh, more comment than a question from Mary during the webinar regarding the burgers and suggesting black bean and mushroom burgers also as a very uh, appetizing option to to have instead of meat products of course so yeah. now um, we're getting into the interactive part of the web webinar and I'm, I'm really uh, glad we still have a few minutes I just wanted to start off with a few uh, polls that you can all participate in and I'll they're not it's not like an exam so you don't get rated but you can vote now and you can click multiple options so it's not a mono uh, multiple choice it's actually multi multiple choice so uh, what is eco innovation and you can um, pick uh, it's either one option is sustainability in all operations or you can say it's life cycle and corporation approach or it's a business strategy or you say it's none of the above and I see uh, we have about a third have voted, so I'll leave it open for five more seconds and uh, close it now, and then we'll look at the results. And maybe, uh, Jordi, maybe you can comment this, uh, what, what, what were the responses, and do you have anything to say about that? Jordi. Are you here? Yes, sorry, I had okay. muted the yeah. camera. 
So are these responses all right, or is there is there anything um, that you wanted to say? Uh, well, maybe not quite. Or let me check. Um, I, I saw this very small. I, I'm just making it larger. Now I can read. Um, what is your innovation? Yeah. Uh, Eco-innovation is, a, as I said, it's a mix of, of, of many of, of, the, of some of the answers. No? Uh, it's, it's a business strategy, indeed. Uh, it's not only improving a, a product, or it's not, and it's not a single action of, intro, of introducing sustainability in a company. So it's not just recycling, but it has to, to do with the strategy of the company. So all the operations have to, to deal with, uh, with this. So it has a life cycle uh, approach, and many times it requires cooperation. So that uh, eco-innovative companies or, or, or companies, when also when do, when do they innovate, it's not a matter of innovating alone. Sometimes you can do this alone, but many times you need to, to share uh, this process with other uh, partners. No? And the suppliers are not suppliers anymore, are your strategic partners uh, in, this, in this process. No? And of course, yeah, and it incorporates sustainability in, in all the operations. So yeah, the, the, the three first are, Okay. Are part of, and, of the same answer. And Jordi, I I wanted to add. Uh, Mary asked to uh, hear more about life cycle incorporation approach, and I I hope that was enough. Otherwise, Mary, please um, raise your hand again, and we'll come back to that right away. So now we have another poll we can take uh, right away, and um, this is maybe to the very end of it. Uh, potential benefits of eco innovation, and again, you can click on multiple of these boxes. Uh, you can also click on all of them or none of them. But please go ahead and vote now, uh, if you can. Um, uh, I leave the poll open for a few more seconds. Let's see, we have seventy-seven percent have voted, and I'm going to close the poll in three seconds. Okay, okay, that's it. And now we can look at the results. And maybe, Jordi, maybe you can again give a quick run through of uh, what you think is maybe also more important or less relevant benefits of eco innovation. Yeah. Shall we start at the top with efficiency and cost savings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, I have talked about. Uh, it's different for, for uh, topics. Um, yeah, I, I agree that create new markets or the, the demand is the strongest uh, driver. No? Yesterday we had a, a, a session, a, a meeting with the Catalan Minister for, for the Environment on, on circular economy. And of course there were uh, both approaches, no? from uh, people who said that uh, there need to be regulations, so to, to legislate, uh, to force companies to move towards uh, this uh, direction, and uh, the other, the opposite uh, trend, no? that is, do not regulate, uh, the market uh, will work if, if there is demand. And I, I, I believe what, what I've seen in the last uh, eight years working on, uh, as a consultant on, on these topics is that uh, when uh, a company has a demand, uh, the changes are very, very fast. So we, we are in an economy in, 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 in Europe, uh, most companies are SMEs and uh, that serve uh, larger companies. So I work for lots of SMEs for instance, uh, packaging uh, companies uh, that sell their products to very large um, cosmetics uh, brands such as L'Oreal, uh, various, um, 
and once L'Oreal says uh, to this company, look, uh, I want a more sustainable packaging, uh, this small company that has never thought about sustainability uh, makes a change in a matter of uh, two weeks. No? Uh, the message is very strong and if companies are proactive, they can also um, have better access to, to, to new markets, to international markets. Of course, saving, uh, savings is, is, is also an issue. Uh, for me, this is a very important, the cost saving, uh, because um, when, when we finish an eco-design project, most times, uh, not, of course not, not always, we cannot guarantee this, but maybe 90% of the projects have uh, a saving, a cost saving associated in terms of uh, optimizing the use of, of resources. And uh, yes, of course, the image, the reputation is uh, every time uh, more and more important uh, because also new consumers, you know, the, the, the millennials and, and um, the new people that are, are starting to, to consume uh, have uh, other values and, and also change. Uh, uh, at least in at least in you, I don't know how it's in the in the U.S., but we are selling more and more companies that instead of of selling the product, just uh, provide access to the to the product to the good, but do do not uh, sell it. Uh, so, for for instance, uh, car manufacturers, of course, they do they still sell the cars but they are all of them working very seriously on car sharing initiatives because they see that um, young consumers uh, 30 years ago when when uh, when people turned 18 the first thing they did was uh, to ask for the driving license and, and buy a car but now this is not the case anymore but people still use these cars so they are um, starting uh, car sharing companies where people pay a fee, a monthly fee, and pay for the using a car. But then you can choose which kind of car you want, if it's a small, larger, etc. Uh, in in each case, no. So business models that offer access to the to the product instead of of selling it, and and this is also a, a, a very interesting trend that allows uh, eco innovation. I think I think we see that to some degree in the United States as well, and I think it's actually an interesting uh, observation because, of course, the legal or the regulatory frameworks are quite different. For example, you mentioned you have a minister for the circular economy. Did you should say that? Well, for, for, minister for the environment, but which are leading his. He's leading the, the circular economy. I mean, uh, one year ago, close to one year ago, this December 2015, uh, the European Union uh, launched the circular economy package, which uh, it's a, a package of a legislat legislative uh, package that will uh, act on uh, waste directives, uh, eco-design directives, and will fund uh, the change of, of the economy. But this is going down, down to, to the states, to regions, to companies, and uh, it's, it's the only way to go, you know, according to what the, the minister said yesterday. Yeah. Well, that's, that's very good to know because I think, I mean, of course, here we are in a different environment, but we also have the same constraints. You mentioned that in the beginning with two-thirds of the copper being already mined. So there isn't, you know, if we don't recycle it, there's not that much left, actually, that we can use. And a situation might be similar for other materials, other raw materials. And even if we're not strictly running out of things, it still is beneficial because of the many other uh, benefits that you mentioned it here, I mean, which can be cost saving, but also you mentioned the job creation aspect, the local economy aspect, that's really, really important, I think, uh, no matter where you stand on, on certain aspects. And 
I'm I'm impressed because that means it's something where you get actually businesses, the environment, and consumers on the same table in a way. Exactly, and it it uh, reverts uh, the dynamics. Um, I will explain you the, the the case in in Spain. In Spain, uh, was became became a member uh, of the EU in the in the eighties. The environmental standards in Spain were very low, but in a matter of years. Uh, we had to rise our standards to Swedish levels, no? Uh, so uh, there was a change in all legislation in water management or wastewater management, waste management, energy, etc. So in, in the matter of 20 years, all the companies had to make an administrations and research centers have to to do a, a race, no? A race to 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 deal to to meet the the required standards, and we did this, and, and the environmental quality uh, is now uh, very very good. I mean, we're in a good in a good standards, um, but uh, companies do perceive uh, environment, the environment or sustainability as a cost, an added cost. So I do my business, which is the serious economy, and besides this, I'm forced to have a wastewater treatment plant, no? uh, and this is a cost. And the perception is this one: what we are changing, and what the circular economy and eco innovation uh, change, uh, is to align business and uh, sustainability. How can we make uh, good business, doing good for the environment as well, and how can we? Uh, have an European uh, industrial policy that respects the environment and environmental policies that uh, do foster industrial development uh, but uh, at the same time being more resilient being aware that the resources will be for sure in the future more scarce and more expensive and that Europe has to import. Europe imports more than 90% of the energy that that is consumed in in Europe, and the same figure uh, is for the for the materials. So we are basically extremely dependent on on imports of raw materials and energy. So we we, we if if we if we want to be resilient, if we want to be successful in the midterm, we need to make business out of the resources that are currently present in our economy and cut dependency on 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 imports and on uh, raw materials so one question you you talk a lot about products so about uh, physical products how is eco innovation uh, relevant in, innovation relevant for services and service industries can you very briefly we only have a few minutes left can you do that in in a, like 2 minute time frame something yep. about the service sector yeah uh, in fact uh, uh, eco innovation and, and also the, the circular economy which which are frameworks that are, are names that are uh, pretty similar in, in terms of, of meaning um, will require a change on the business models um, from an economy of selling uh, products to economy that provides services by using products so the product does not disappear but is not uh, sold uh, the company does not uh, lose the property of the product rather uh, gives access to the, right. the customers um, because it's a strategic asset you know, the, the, the materials so we, I well not, not, not only me but uh, literature has says uh, that uh, an eco innovative uh, economy will be uh, more service based that we are in a um, product we were facing to product service systems so, yeah, so in, instead of, for instance, uh, furniture, uh, instead of buying uh, chairs for an auditorium and paying $100 per chair and knowing that in 10 years 
you will have to share, t change these these chairs. Uh, you just pay a leasing of ten dollars per year. So at the end of the ten years, you have paid the same. But if the producer uh, is smart and uh, makes more durable products, uh, products can be chairs that can be repaired, that can be maintained, that can be cleaned, uh, that are not uh, old-fashioned, uh, then the durability becomes a uh, profit for the company. The more this product is in the economy doing a service, uh, providing a service, uh, is better for, for the company, for the benefit of the company. And uh, this is happening in many sectors that uh, are changing towards a service economy. Thank you, Jordi. Thank you. I think we're about at the end of our webinar because we don't want to go too far over the time frame. We said we aim for 50 minutes. We already beyond 55 minutes, where we definitely want to end it here now. I know there might be a lot more questions, and of course feel free to reach out to Jordi or to me, and I wanted to say, of course, the Pocasito webinar series is going to continue. You're going to receive an invitation if you're on our email list, or you can contact us, so I put you on the list. And uh, we will, of course, share the recording of today's session on our website, on the YouTube channel, and uh, feel free to contact us with any follow-up questions. Uh, Jordi, we already received a question if you will share also the slides of today separately. So that would okay, be much sure. appreciated. No, no and, problem. And we can upload them as well. And then, of course, uh, Jordi, thank you very much. It was very, very interesting to see all these specific examples. I think that's what really makes the presentation really valuable, is to see really what was done in specific business environments and how this was made turned into a success. And I want to thank you. And I want to thank all of you for joining us here today. Uh, I saw a lot of comments and uh, I also thank you for participating in our interactive polls and Jordi if you want to have a last word you have uh, five seconds to say something very brief and then we will close the session. Well just just to say thank you very much for inviting me Max and uh, it's been a pleasure and I, I hope that uh, yeah we can continue uh, with these uh, US and Europe exchanges because they are very fruitful and, and interesting and I think in, in, the, in the years to come uh, this collaboration is, is more and more necessary. Thank Absolutely. You. Absolutely. Very good closing words. Thank you Jordi. Thank you everybody and uh, see you then in the very near future for a next uh, webinar in the Pocasito series. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye.